Barry Weiss is out with part five of the Twitter files. This latest installation shines light on key correspondence between Twitter employees and executives in the days following January 6th. So let's get into it. According to Weiss's reporting, after January 6th, Twitter employees organized to demand that their employer ban former President Trump. One staffer said, we have to do the right thing and ban this account. Another said, it's pretty obvious he's going to try to thread the needle of incitement without violating the rules. Now, on January 8th, Twitter's safety team unequivocally decided that Trump's tweets on the day of the Capitol breach were not in violation of Twitter policy. Quote, it's a clear no. However, less than 90 minutes after Twitter employees had determined Trump tweets as permissible, Vijaya Gad, Twitter's head of legal policy and trust, asked whether they could in fact be coded incitement for further violence. Members of Twitter's scaled enforcement team then wrote, they quote, view Trump as the leader of a terrorist group responsible for violence deaths comparable to Christchurch shooter or Hitler. And on that basis and on the totality of his tweets, Thus, quote, he should be deplatformed. After a 30-minute all-staff meeting, Twitter officially announced Trump's suspension, to which Twitter employees responded enthusiastically, one writing, quote, for the longest time Twitter's stance was that we aren't the arbiter of truth, which I respected, but never gave me a warm, fuzzy feeling. So this is a pretty uh, substantive uh, release on, in terms of the Twitter files, um, showing how this decision was made. And I, I think, frankly, there's a lot to be quite critical of uh, how these people were, were thinking through these decisions, um, you know, it was not. So this is po this is after the event has taken place, January sixth. January sixth, very bad. I've said it many times. Absolutely, I feel it is correct to hold Trump morally responsible for what happened. He should not be president again because of it. He should have ceased being president in the as it was happening. Or there it, might even be an argument for incitement for other things that well, he said we, that day outside of Twitter. Right, but that's the point. The things he was saying that are really bad and, and it should have some consequence for were not things he was saying in Twitter. It right. was things he was saying there right. to the crowd. Right. You can argue that he stoked, that he was giving hyperbolic uh, language, the things he was saying were not true about what had happened to the election. He, he stoked a irate mob that then lost control and, and, and did this. Now, you can also, you can point to that he, you know, he didn't say it should be violent. He said it should be peaceful. What, there's perfectly legitimate pushback you can make to that, et cetera. I don't know. I don't think it would be enough, frankly, from my layman's understanding of the First Amendment. I don't think you could actually charge him with inciting a riot, given how robust our free speech protections are under this current Supreme Court. A Supreme Court from 80 years ago, you probably could charge him with, for, for inciting a riot. But all that said, it was the speech the day of to an actual crowd of people. Twitter's getting a little self-obsessed here and thinking it's the tweets are causing the, the like the violence was passed. So right. I don't know what the justification is for shutting him down forever based on what he said on Twitter when the bad thing is what he said to an actual crowd of people. Yeah, I think that's right. And in an article that's actually called, <laughs> the tweets that got Trump banned were far from his worst, from Wired, which is like a, a left-leaning organization. You know, they point out that you know, the, the, his last tweets were, okay, the 75,000, uh, sorry, 75 million great American patriots who voted for me, America's first, and make America great again, will have a giant voice long into the future. They will not be disrespected or treated unfairly in any way, shape, or form. Yeah. That, that kind of thing is going to get you weak. banned. Or, and, and, and I'm not going to the inauguration. Yeah, to all of those very who are, I will not be going to the very inauguration. Very weak the sauce. You know, so at the, at the end of the day, this disclosure, what it tells you is that they actually had a process by mm -hmm. which they evaluated whether or not Trump's tweets violated Twitter policy. They said no. It does not violate mm -hmm. the incitement policy. Then there was an, addi an additional conversation about whether or not, in the broader context of the tweets, et cetera, et cetera, we could just label it as incitement to violence, mark it as incitement to violence anyway, to get the job done. And I, that's a problem. I mean, I can understand the argument. I, like, frankly, I don't disagree with it that there was just a riot because of the, the remarks he was making to a crowd. He has paused on this platform until things cool down. I think that's fine. I, I did not object when they did this on that basis. Saying that because permanent of the things he's tweeted, he's permanently, that just doesn't make any sense. The and they're admitting America? there that it yeah. doesn't make any sense. Yes. That they had to come up with a justification, and that justification is lame. Yeah. So look, I will say this. I have had mixed feelings about various aspects of the Twitter file disclosures. I think that some of them could have a lot of import 
more broadly. For example, mm -hmm. I'm particularly interested in the reporting on shadow banning, which has the same flavor as this, right? Who, what kind of politics, what kind of messaging is Twitter um, is trying to shape uh, with its ability to either highlight, suppress, or ban voices on the app? I think that is really the critical core issue that a lot of people hope that Elon Musk would confront when he got in here. The problem is, so far, the disclosures have not been holistic. So they have kind of found individuals, cherry-picked folks, and revealed that this person got shadow banned and that person got shadow banned. But a lot of leftists are very frustrated, and I hope Matt Taibbi, as someone who has been sympathetic to the left, mm -hmm. starts to be more holistic in terms of what the releases are so it can't be so easily framed as right, you know, the right mm -hmm. is being targeted when we know that it is, it is across the ideological spectrum and people who are not the establishment are being targeted. But this disclosure, this disclosure, unlike some of the others, I think, because it is narrower, is more clearly relevant and, and substantive, as you said. And it'll be interesting to see what the mainstream media does with this and if they continue to do the nothing burger dance. Yeah, they're not covering it. this at all. Uh, also, one other aspect of this I wanted to touch on, So, one of those people saying, like, right, this is akin to you know Hitler inciting hatred or something, we take action. Honestly, both Twitter and Facebook and, and other content moderators have to deal with a problem of you don't always know, like uh, the Supreme Court of, of Facebook. Facebook has this separate body that can reverse Facebook. The kinds of cases they look at are you know, somewhere in Central Africa or Southeast Asia where there's two ethnic groups or two religious groups that hate each other and there will be a tweet or there will be a, a piece of content accusing the other group. The other group is kidnapping children and raping them. And should that and and now this group is mad there could be violence because of that piece of content but is that piece of content true like the facebook mm -hmm. doesn't know they don't have people there on the ground it's a it's a contentious civil war type thing you know we're talking in undeveloped parts of the world and do you leave up a piece of content like that it's not easy these are not easy calls yeah. very you know people who are experts in civil rights law and human rights law and free speech and and want to have the thumb on the scales of free speech find these to be difficult calls because they actually don't know the factual, uh, the factual reality of what's going on. And you don't want to silence people who are speaking out against, maybe there is sexual abuse and kidnapping and violence going on, and you're, 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 sen you're essentially censoring conversation about that. Or maybe it's made up and it's all yeah. lies. Like in Myanmar, where they ended up having violence against the, uh, the native Rohingya Muslim population whipped up by like the generals of the repressive government, uh, that wasn't true. But they, we don't know. Yeah, it strikes it's me tough. that there's there's nothing really new here, right? To your point, people have propagandized against the other side and vilify their enemies since time immemorial. What feels different here is that normally there is not a central body that is in control of whether or not yeah. that messaging gets seen. And it feels a little bit like a trolley problem, where the issue is that we are now having someone who could standing at the lever who decides who gets harmed, but there's no easy way out of this. There's either harm that happens to people's civil liberties and free speech rights, or there is potentially harm that happens as a consequence of, of that speech. And I get it. It doesn't give you a warm, fuzzy feeling to sit, sit, to sit there and say, I'm not going to be the arbiter of truth. But in the absence of an alternative, and I think that they should be working toward alternatives with these boards and just trying to get to mm -hmm. drill down to the core of, of what their responsibilities are. But in the absence of the, alternative, the alternatives, I don't judge folks for wanting to take a, a step step back and a more hands-off approach, especially if we're not actually approximating those levels of violence, especially if it is the day after 1-6. Uh, mm -hmm. And, you know, especially if there's other ways to intervene, like having a more short-term pause and a permanent ban. Yeah, and it sounds like they knew that, but felt internal pressure from activist employees to reach some other conclusion, and, and then eventually from figures like Vijaya Gad, et cetera, uh, coming to some kind of conclusion that was really actually at odds with what the, 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 the real moderation team was kind of doing. Yeah, I agree. I might call them liberal employees as opposed to activist employees. You're an, <laughs> if I don't like what you're doing, you're an activist. If I like what you're doing, you're an advocate. That's the difference there. Yeah. <laughs> I'm, I'm glad there's a self-awareness there, Robbie. <laughs> All right. More rising after this. Stay with us.